Hi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Carl Tiedemann, Director of Outreach for Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you here this afternoon. Um, I'll be introducing the other speakers in this uh, panel session. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from Jonathan Bates, a permaculturist and co-author of Paradise Lost. So, um, Jonathan? Oh, whoops, well. Lot, lot, lot. Oh, I beg your pardon. That's okay. It's e very easy to get, uh, no, that's not the one. Yes. Which one's yours? Uh, it's, uh, I have to see it, I don't remember the name. It says Paradise Lot on it. Where's the laser on this thing? I was looking for the laser. I like lasers. <clears throat> Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's very nice to be given some extra time. Um, I guess, I don't know if I'm more important or maybe I was loud enough, I'm not sure which. But, um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about my project uh, in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and um, relating the work we've done there. It's a one-tenth acre uh, urban garden uh, to, to permaculture, which was talked about today. Um, and talking a little bit about the details regarding how we did it, the design process, and then some of the outcomes that we um, experienced in the last uh, 12 years in the project. Okay. Uh, who here has been, uh, been to Holyoke, Massachusetts? Wow, almost everyone, holy moly. Usually I get no one to say that. <laughs> Uh, so this slide isn't all that important, but I just wanted to give you some perspective. The little middle, the red middle finger over there, uh, that's Holyoke, it's in Hamden County. Uh, that's my city, a little picture of the canals and the city hall, it's a great picture. And then over here on the right is a, a map of the, the, the Connecticut River and how it bends around to create this situation where uh, 150 years ago they were able to build canals and it powered the whole industry um, that go across the landscape. And then that little red arrow is pointing actually pretty much right where my house is on the map. So I'm, I'm downtown, it's very urban. We're about a mile from downtown to give you perspective. Um, and then some more perspective, that's our neighborhood. Uh, the house uh, on the left, the white one, that's my house. And you can get an idea of how, how ur urbanized it is, is, lots of asphalt, and we're very close together. Um, and then the, there's two, it's a duplex, so two families together, my family and Eric Tonsmeyer, my co-author. Uh, we bought the house together in 2004, and um, I love that picture because it's the, really the only picture of the two families together, and it happens to be from the New York Times. So it, it was kind of a nice thing to have. And then the book that is for sale at the Harvard uh, Co-op here, there's a table out if you wanted to buy a copy, it's essentially more in depth of of the story I'm telling today, um, if you'd like to do that. I'm gonna get it into a little bit about the project itself. Um, I'm gonna get that off there. Uh, so we guard using permaculture design, and um, Allison mentioned some about that early in an earlier talk, so I won't get into what permaculture is, um, but we s essentially think that by using this technique, we're able to build soil that restores degraded land. It provides ecosystem services like habitat and rainwater infiltration. Uh, contributes to a just food system and self-determination for communities because it's a, looking at the food system and actually the community system as a whole system together. So just uh, food system is an important aspect of that, critical, the roots actually of what we're doing. And it also, uh, believe it or not, if we do enough of it, we'll stabilize the global climate through carbon sequestration. Um, there's lots of different techniques and ideas and theories and technologies we could be using, but building soil through permanent agriculture is one of the best shots we've got. And so to be able to do that on our one tenth, tenth of an acre lot, we, uh, we designed and, and built what we call an edible forest garden, or in some regions of the world, it's also called a food forest and uh, more appropriately, in most of the tropics, uh, home gardens have been grown for thousands of years. And so that's uh, really, I wanna take the, the credit that we're, uh, that, 
that I want to give to people that have been doing these ideas for thousands of years, indigenous peoples all over the world. What we've done is we've adapted the ideas to a temperate climate and called it edible forest gardens. Because it really hasn't been done like, particularly like this on this continent for a long time. Native Americans here used to, used to do uh, some of these techniques. But they mimic the structure and function of a forest ecosystem. It's obvious. Uh, we, we, if we do a lot of tillage forever and ever, we won't have anything left. So we want to base our gardening and farming on what the ecology shows us, which is building a forest, growing a forest. Designed for low maintenance, uh, attracts wildlife and expands habitat. And we can also grow non-food products, construction material, livestock fodder, fuel wood, fertilizers, medicine. And that little image there is a, cro a cross section of what, uh, kind of a famous cross section of what you're looking at when you look uh, at uh, from old field to forest, the edge here. Uh, it's also how we want to design um, our food gardens perennially because you capture a lot of sunlight on this edge and you can also grow um, things in, in the nor on the north edge to, to maximize the light in the northern climates. So for our particular uh, project in Holyoke, Mass, um, Paradise Lot, we're calling it because that's the, the book's title. It used to be called a Holyoke Edible Forest Garden. Now we we're naming it after the book since the book's become so popular. But we had these design goals going into the project uh, in 2004 before anything was ever designed or, or planted. Uh, so our, our goals were we want to create food abundance by mimicking a young forest. We pick a handful of fresh greens or fruit every day. We weren't doing this to feed, feed ourselves all the food we grew to feed ourselves in the, in the back ten, ten, tenth of an acre. And we're also partners with a garden rather than managers of the garden. That is, uh, we're, we're doing this uh, to be uh, not imposing our opinions and views on the landscape, but rather uh, growing in a way we think um, mimics nature, uh, but also feeds us and, and observing and adapting based on what happens once we establish the system. This little um, image here with arrow, essentially the question I'm asking, this was one of our biggest questions going into it, was uh, our first goal is we create food abundance by making young forest. Essentially this has never really been um, uh, attempted in Massachusetts in the way that we were going to attempt it in that this is a, a old field growing back to forest. This is the most productive um, in terms of food for wildlife the old field or the mid-succession ecology. Um, but we can't really survive off of goldenrod and white pine and uh, red maple uh, and sumac, even though you can use almost all those plants I just mentioned for as herbs or uh, uh, vegetables or um, teas. But uh, you could probably only, maybe a, a small family could subsist on this big of an acreage, and maybe not even for very long. So. If you are trying to mimic this, a, a mid-succession forest ecosystem to create food for humans, uh, what does that look like and how do you do it? That's what our, we were kind of striving to do in this, in this project. And to do that, we wanted to observe this site as best we could and mix the observations with the goals that we had for ourselves to help inform the design. And that's really the basis for permaculture design. Uh, observing the site, uh, having your goals set and then and then the, that helps you inform the design. So here's a picture of the, uh, the blank s slate or empty canvas uh, that we were working with, um, pretty barren, barren there. And when we started to, once the design was finished, we start, started to build soil, uh, essentially using sheet mulch techniques where you're layering like a lasagna garden, where you're layering uh, minerals and, and uh, seedy uh, composts and manure at the bottom, and then covering that with cardboard to keep the weeds and the weed seeds down and then non-weedy materials above the cardboard, compost, leaves, wood chips uh, to build a soil over the original soil which was re very degraded and we, we called it, it was filled with urbanite. Anyone ever heard that term before? It's essentially rocks made with cement and asphalt. And it was very, in some areas very clay, in some areas it's very sandy. Um, so we had to build, build more soil to get it to go quickly, we had to build more, more soil above six to 12 inches uh, eventually using uh, good local compost, uh, 
dumpstered uh, w cardboard and then leaves from the surrounding neighborhood in the fall. We actually, it looks like this might even be spring, and then we, these leaves were held over from the fall before. So once we figured out our design and we started um, um, mulching and, and doing the soil building on the landscape, we wanted to figure out how we get, could now apply the design we created into the landscape. Um, and as we were going along, we, we realized there were some challenges, and in permaculture, challenges are actually opportunities. So in this little red dot circle here, that's one of the patches that we were working with I'll talk about in a minute. So we broke this, the landscape up into multiple patches. There were some sunny patches, some shady patches, some areas that were a little bit wetter, some that were compacted, some of that were, um, the soil was really bad, and then some soil that was a little less bad. <laughs> Um, and so in this case, I'm just outlining two, uh, we designed with plants for shade. So we knew we wanted some, some edible and useful plants we were going to grow, could grow well in shade. And then other areas where there was poor soil, uh, in this case we wanted a shed, uh, poor soil grows good sheds. So it's kind of max, matching what we find in the landscape with our goals. Uh, and that, that's what this created this plan. So I talked a little bit about patches. So this was kind of the, the matrix of the whole design, this idea of pat, patchiness. Uh, and we're not just designing in patches based on the characteristics of what we found, but also designing through time. So if you can imagine, this right here is a Native American persimmon. And before we put that in, we wanted to think about, well, where would a 70-foot a, a tall tree go in the landscape? It's not gonna go in at 70 feet, but in 10 to 30 to 40 years, it's gonna be 70 feet tall. How is that gonna impact the landscape uh, in the future? So we had to think out really far and work backwards. Uh, we also work in shorter time frames. We design for things like sp spring and summer, and the, the plants are arranged in a way that maximize the landscape to their, their best uh, during different seasons. And so this is the same patch spring and summer, very different. But we sometimes don't think in terms of seasons either. Um, and so I didn't mention this, but the pink is uh, examples of uh, permaculture principles. So I said one already, which was um, challenges become solutions. We also work with multifunctional elements. In this case, Eric and I are both plant geeks, and the basis of an edible forest garden are perennial polycultures of multipurpose plants. That's kind of a, a mouthful. but. That is perennials being growing, they're gro you put them in the ground, they grow for more than uh, two years. Uh, polycultures, that is plants growing together to support one another uh, and not compete. So that actually is, there's some strategies to do that. It's not just throwing plants in the ground, hope that they don't compete, it's actually thinking about them and their, their ele elements in the landscape. And then multi-purpose, that is each plant has more than one, one purpose. You, you think of blueberry bushes, this, their main purpose is blueberries, but blueberries have uh, amazing fall foliage, they're native, uh, they have pretty flowers, uh, they can grow in acidic soil, so there's various purposes for how you place a, a plant in the landscape. And then the other one, in this case, um, use and value diversity, which we're talking about, a lot about today, which I think is a, a core thing for the work that we're doing. Um, we grew, we're growing over 200 species of plants on a tenth of an acre, and one of the things that we're very proud about is the fact that we have 50% of those are native. And this is both edible and useful, so they're not just, it's got actually quite hard to create an all native edible landscape in, in this part of the world. Uh, so we're super geeks. And uh, so that's a little kind of rundown of, of kind of how we structured the design um, for this project. There's the before picture again. I love this one. The before and the after. So there, there is a shot a couple of years ago, and that's, that's kind of showing about 80 per 85 percent of the species on the landscape. And each year, the picture becomes more and more difficult to distinguish because it, it is very patchy. It is very, very kind of mixed together. And that's the idea. This is like an uh, old field or thicket is what we're striving for because that's the most productive. So it continues to look like this, although it's starting to, f to fill in. Um, I'm going to keep going here. 
There's a little bit of the abundance that we're, we've created, uh, berries, tree, fruit trees, bear, shrubs. Uh, we actually uh, farm mushrooms, various types of mushrooms. We're very into the herbaceous layer, so perennial vegetables and herbs are very uh, important for us. And then also the root layer under all the trees and shrubs and vines and herbs is you have your growing things both for productivity but also for food. And to evaluate this garden, uh, I mentioned these goals in the beginning, we create food abundance by mimicking a young forest. One example for infinite yield, another permaculture principle, 400 pounds of perennial food created in 2011. That doesn't include annual vegetables, so you can maybe double that for annuals. Uh, we pick a handful of fresh greens and fruit every day. Uh, we found that we meet about 80% of our fruit and greens needs during the growing season. Uh, and then we also meet about 20% of our food needs during year round because we also have a big greenhouse where we produce some food. So that includes that. And then our, we, are we a, we, we're partners with the garden rather than managers of the garden. And I would say in this case, the, the principle for permaculture is observe it, interact. Uh, we've observed that our weeds become eggs and compost because we feed the weeds to the chickens in their chicken coop. They poop on it, scratch it around, it becomes compost, and then they create eggs for us every day. So a problem becomes a solution, weeds become a yield. Uh, abundance of baby plants generate income. I started six years ago, I started a nursery out of the abundance from this landscape, and now I'm grossing $10,000 in four months. Um, so th there's yields. I didn't even expect that. That wasn't a, a goal of ours, and it's just happening by itself uh, that I'm taking advantage of it. And then this, this is applicable to a lot of what's been talked about today. The soil is thriving and mineralized, and it's sequestering carbon 7.5 tons in 10 years. And to give you an idea of, of what that means is we did some calculations, and if you extrapolate that out for an acre, that is one person annual carbon use in the United States could be offset if they grew one acre at edible forest garden. So that's pretty powerful. Just this one technique, if we utilized it uh, in, in even um, degraded landscapes, it wouldn't have to be good crop, croppable fields. It could be degraded urban hillsides, edges. If we did an acre, enough for an acre per person in the United States, we would sequester all the carbon we need to, to deal with climate change at least for the USers. So I'll just end with uh, some information about educational opportunities. Uh, we do uh, a permaculture design course. It's a six week session course, so you don't have to go for a whole week or a whole two weeks. It's weekend based. That's in the fall starting this year. Uh, and then we have workshops, tours, and plant sales at my house in Holyoke. And you can check that out on our website, foodforestfarm.com. And then I'm also offering today a free consult. I have a basket out on my table. It's right behind this wall. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about these regenerative ideas and, and have a landscape that you're trying to implement some of these ideas and want to learn something more from me, uh, either stick your business card in there. I also have paper you can fill out if you don't have paper or use just rip a piece of paper from your notebook and name, town, phone, email, and put it in the basket on my table out there. Um, thanks very much. It's really hard to do it that quickly. It's quite stunning. <laughs>